This meeting is being recorded. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jamie Ward, an associate professor of public relations at EMU and a faculty mentor for the Digital Summer Clinic. We are happy to have you here today at the Google Virtual Tour. I'm here today with Anna Milan, a field manager for the Center for Digital Engagement, to again kick off this tour. Uh, we're sponsored today by Ann Arbor Spark and the Center for Digital Engagement. So I'm going to share my screen here, do a couple of housekeeping things for a moment. Let's get this up. All right, maybe not sharing today. There we go. Joining us on our tour today, we have Eric Wortman, the Senior Account Manager at Google and an Executive in Residence at the Digital Summer Clinic. We have Ehab Shalabi, New Business Strategist at Google, and Osaid Ketu, a Digital Strategist Lead at Google. Before I turn things over to Eric uh, and really kick off our tour and more formally introduce our panelists, I wanted to provide some quick reminders about the clinic applications and some upcoming events we have going on. Applications are currently open for our Digital Summer Clinic. The internship runs for nine weeks, uh, June 13th to August 12th. We have 48 intern positions with 24 companies. These are all paid positions at $17 an hour. There are five mentors to help guide interns through the clinic and through the processes of working with the companies. Uh, Bud Gibson, who's our director at the Center for Digital Engagement, myself, Sufrian Krunfla, or Dr. Q, who is our interim department head of marketing and associate professor of supply chain management at EMU. And then our executives in residence, Eric Wortman and Jarrell McCree from Pinterest. You can learn more and fill out an application at digitalsummer.clinic. Anna will put that link in the chat for all of you. Applications will close on April 30th. Lastly, I wanted to remind you that next Friday, April 1st, from 10 to 11.30, Jarrell McCree will be hosting our virtual Pinterest tour. Registration is still open for that event. Again, Anna will throw that link up in the chat as well. And then every Wednesday, we have our digital live events um, featuring individual companies and past interns uh, to get more information regarding our clinic. Before I turn things over to Eric, I want to encourage all of you to post your questions, any questions you have for our panelists in the chat, uh, and we'll get to them throughout that presentation. Eric, uh, without further ado, I'll turn things over to you. All right, hello everyone. I'm going to attempt to share my screen, so. Eric, you muted if you are, or say if you're talking or not. Okay, you can hear me now? We can hear you. Okay, mm -hmm. I think it yeah. muted when I shared. Sorry about that. Let me try one more time. It has you're unmuted now. All right, it's uh, muting me when I share the slides. So uh, we can go without slides though. I thought, I thought it might be better just to not look at me and uh, our lovely panelists the entire time. I but... can try and share if you'd like. Oh, sure. You'll have to send me the slides. Yes, what is the best uh, email to do? It's jward29 at emish. Okay. And then I can get those shared while you start talking. J Ward 29. Yep. There you are. This is what happens when you throw a bunch of Googlers on Zoom. We're 
we're not experts at everything, sadly. So this happens almost every time. So I'm sure, I'm sure everyone else can vouch for me. Um, all right, so thanks for uh, bearing with us. So again, appreciate the technical difficulties. Also appreciate those uh, of you who originally thought that the tour was going to be last week. Uh, we had it all scheduled and then our lovely CEO Sundar uh, gave us the day off. Um, and so it was a little hard to kind of wrangle everyone together. So appreciate the flexibility of those who uh, originally thought it was gonna be last week and we moved it to this week. Um, so, so excited to be uh, talking to everyone today. Um, I think this is, so I'm a proud alum of Eastern Michigan University. Um, I've been at Google about six years now. And over that time, I've really kind of seen this uh, amazing pipeline of, um, EMU alums come to Google uh, before, you know, I felt like I kind of knew everyone on a first name basis. Maybe there's a couple of us scattered. And now it seems like every year there's more people at EMU or kind of in the, uh, the broader family that, um, you know, are either in the Ann Arbor office or spread throughout uh, one of the many Google offices. So um, first off, I just want to say, you know, welcome. Feel free to reach out to any of us whenever you have any questions, uh, obviously today, but then via LinkedIn, uh, we can, you know, share our emails. If you see us, you know, around town or, you know, in Southeast Michigan, uh, we would love to, you know, collaborate with you, connect with you and help you along your career path, whether that be towards Google or anywhere else, uh, digital or any other field. So just a little, you know, welcome and some suggestions there. Um, I think if we go to the next slide, I have a little agenda that we could show share with you. Um, so first we'll be doing, <laughs> stuff is going great today. Stuff is this going is, great today. Uh, yeah, this is what happens when you do stuff on a Friday, but it's all good. Um, we'll do an overview of kind of like Google in general. Um, just, uh, you're probably familiar with the company, but just some of the, uh, the facts and insights that, you know, that we like to share with people and then uh, dive a little bit deeper into uh, Google Ann Arbor specifically. There's uh, actually a very large presence of Google across Michigan, um, but wanted to focus especially on kind of the area here in Ann Arbor. Um, and then myself, Osaid and Ehab will be telling you a little bit more about uh, ourselves. Um, so kind of our career paths um, that we came out of Eastern, um, and then prior to Google and then at Google. Um, and we'll tell you a little bit about our roles as well. Um, I'll even kind of maybe interject with some questions. And then that'll be a little bit more of a uh, question and answer session. Um, and then we get a lot of questions on, you know, careers at Google, internship, internship opportunities at Google. So I have some information there. Unfortunately, um, we had somebody from PeopleOps that wasn't able to join. Uh, PeopleOps, HR, our hiring department. Um, they weren't able to join, but I have a lot of information from them. So I will do my very best to try to give you as much information as you can if you are curious about uh, applying for an internship or a role at Google. Uh, but don't worry. Again, you could always reach out to us. We'd you know, be happy to help you um, answer, get any questions answered and um, you know, learn more about uh, working at Google. Um, and a lot of the things, information I share about working at Google, I think applies to similar companies like Pinterest, which you'll be hearing about more in the coming weeks. Um, via Jarrell um, or, you know, Amazon, LinkedIn, or in Facebook, any of the other kind of similar, you know, tech marketing sales companies that um, have a good presence in the area. All right. So with that, we'll kind of dive a bit more into the uh, formal agenda. So if you go to the next slide, Jamie. All right. See, look, now, now we're, we're smooth. So we're, we, we learn. It only took us 13 minutes. So I have to start. I think I'm con contractually obligated to let you know that Google's uh, mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. All companies have some, you know, broad uh, goal, some broad mission statement like that. Um, but I think this one actually kind of works really well. Like any product that you have really does, I think, come back to this mission statement. So you think of Google search as the most obvious. Okay, let's, um, you know, maybe, I don't know how old everyone is on this call, but if you remember a time kind of before Google, finding something was a bit, Google or any of the other search engines was a bit more difficult. Now it's so easy to get all sorts of information. Um, before, you know, you had to search for something and then click on a link and read an article. Now, a lot of times those answers are even given to you via, you know, Google Assistant or Siri. So think of how much easier information is given to you. So Google search is the easy one, but think about something a little bit different, like, uh, like Waymo, uh, Google's driverless cars. That's taking all of the physical information, all the location information, and it's making it useful by having autonomous vehicles that can then navigate the spaces for us. Um, so it's, 
I do encourage you, whether you're looking at YouTube or Google or, or uh, you know, you're not going to be in a Waymo car anytime soon, but any, you know, if you have a Pixel phone, any sort of uh, Google product, it all kind of comes back down to this core mission statement, which makes it an effective mission statement, um, in my opinion, uh, if you go to the next slide. So way, way back in 95, uh, these two kind of, you know, stylish looking dudes over here, Sergey and Larry. Um, Larry is actually from East Lansing, but went to the University of Michigan for undergrad. Um, these two met at Stanford University and started a little project called Backrub. Um, good thing they changed the name. But their idea was instead of just taking search, let's kind of like rank search. And one of the main principles of technology that they had were, um, for everyone familiar with SEO, is backlinks. So if you have, if I have a really good article on, I don't know, some upcoming, you know, sports game or something like that, and everyone's linking to the article, the system could see that, oh, a lot of people are pointing to this, almost like uh, likes or shares or upvotes. They use that as kind of like a crowdsourcing of what is like relevant information. And that was kind of like one of the first layers of technology that they put on to search and make it a bit more meaningful. I remember way, way back in the day, you would go to like the Yahoo search directory and you could basically just go through a directory. It was almost like every single page that was indexed in Yahoo was almost equally weighted. Um, and now you, you know, obviously there's so many more signals that are used. So that's how Google was started. Um, if you go to the next slide, you will see it started and it looked pretty funky. So um, even though there's kind of some weird colors and, um, you know, there's, there's a few things, this is actually still a pretty simple page. Like if you think about it, um, if you think of like ESPN or yahoo.com or any other, you know, New York Times, CNN.com, there's so much on a page and for such like a large, uh, powerful website, it's kind of interesting to think that they were like, nope, we just want to keep it super simple. And so this was one of the first iterations, but they even, they even stripped it down even more. So you're probably familiar with the Google homepage now, just a very simple search bar. Um, sometimes they'll have, you know, a, uh, a mention of, you know, some major, uh, event happening in the world. Um, right now, I think there's a message of support of Ukraine, but the, the homepage is very, very simple. So they always try to keep things simple. Um, if you go to the next slide. So we kind of morphed from that into kind of a larger company. So um, there's actually, so, or if you go one more slide, sorry. So I couldn't find a picture of the uh, original Google office in Ann Arbor. So way back in 2006, uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, Main Street in Ann Arbor, there's a restaurant called Benology. Um, there is a, uh, they opened up a office of, I think it was, you know, only a few dozen people um, above Benology. So it was basically just kind of almost like a loft apartment. Um, and that's where uh, the first Ann Arbor office was. Um, it kind of took, it was very similar to kind of openings of other offices. So I remember the uh, the famous stat is the the first snack that was ever served in a Google office was Swedish fish. So you know that's that's you know so we, we've kind of updated our our, uh, our our offerings since then. But it was just a very kind of simple loft space, a few dozen people, and a lot of the people there were just picking up phones and calling people, um, trying to you know let them know about you know how they could uh, work with Google. So fast forward to. I believe it was 2000, I forget, fast forward to a few years ago, I think it was about four or five years ago, we opened um, Google Shraverwood. So this is where we currently are, uh, the three of us currently sit. So it's just off Plymouth Road. So there's about seven or 800 of us um, currently in the office. Um, there's also even kind of a broader Michigan presence um, uh, for Google across the state. So here in Ann Arbor, we mostly have a lot of salespeople um, we have some other divisions too, but there's also an office in Detroit uh, servicing automotive clients. Um, there is also uh, a some YouTube moderation um, that I think we're moving to Ann Arbor eventually. Um, there is Waymo, our driverless fleet, um, or our driverless cars. There's some office there. Um, there's even um, a book scanning facility that's been here uh, very long, or, um, for I think about 10 years or so um, in the area. Um, I don't believe we have any major uh, like servers or any kind of like tech infrastructure, but we have a lot of uh, offices where you know people go and do other various Google services. So this office has been open about uh, five, you know, four or five years or so. Like I said, there's a few hundred of us. Um, unfortunately, we can't you know host you in person. So I have just a couple pictures to show. This is the main entrance. Uh, and then if you go to the next slide, um, there are a lot of amenities. Uh, this is kind of one of the funkier ones. So we had this area, the office is kind of um, 
you know, built into a slope. And so one of the areas wouldn't have any windows is kind of built in. And so they turned it in kind of like a quiet uh, meditation, you know, uh, not necessarily a nap room, um, but you can kind of make out here some of these kind of leaning back, kicking back on their laptop here. This is actually a nice place because you have to walk through here in order to get to uh, where you get a massage. So uh, if you're lucky enough to have some extra time and get a massage at the office, you kind of walk through this nice quiet room. So, you know, like a lot of modern offices, um, there's a lot of interesting amenities and everything and just trying to make the office more comfortable. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why we're really encouraging uh, people to come back to the office and not going full remote or having the option to always be full remote. Um, in just about, um, I think actually a, exactly a month from today, so on April 18th, we will be transitioning from a remote, um, fully remote optional. So the office is open, I'm currently in the office, but we'll be transitioning from being fully remote optional to uh, being in the office three days a week and then remote optional two days a week. Um, some teams can kind of set their own schedules, um, but for the sales team, which everyone on this call is a part of, will be in the office Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You can come in on Monday and Friday if you'd like, but you are feel free to work from home uh, if you go to the next slide. I think this slide gives kind of a perfect uh, picture of the office. So uh, there's this giant grand open staircase. Uh, there's three where you can access the three floors from. Um, up there on the right, kind of behind the three is our cafe. And then kind of the lighter area up there by the windows, that's kind of a common area. And this is really typical of a lot of Google offices where a, the rule is you're never supposed to be more than 150 feet from food and or beverages. So they wanna make sure people are you know, fed and staying hydrated. Um, they used to have a lot of little cafes and little micro kitchens, we call them, by everyone's desks. And they've kind of pivoted towards more of this kind of social um, layout where you have kind of this, these grand junctions or intersections. And so everyone's desk kind of, um, there's, there's two kind of main hallways that go out from kind of this grand area. And this really encourages you to, you know, okay, I'm here, but I'm going to go get some drinks, go get a coffee or something, and I'll bump into uh, Ahab or, you know, maybe another EMU alum, Angelina or something like that. I will bump into them and say, hey, and have a lot more, you know, just have more people interactions. Um, and it's kind of just like the, that's where a lot of, you know, brainstorm ideas happen or you, you bump into something. It's like, hey, I should ask you a question about this. So they really try to keep the offices, uh, you know, your, where you're kind of designed to cross paths and, and see different people. Um, and yeah, so overall, I think it's a really good office. Unfortunately, we couldn't host you in person, but, uh, you know, maybe hopefully in a few months or next year, uh, if you go to the next slide. So I wanted to dive a little bit deeper on kind of like actual roles and you know what we have at Google. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of, you know we have a large presence of Google across Michigan, but uh, Google's parent company. So we kind of did a reorg, uh, you know, restructured things a few years ago. Um, so Alphabet is the parent company. Um, uh, Sundar is the uh, CEO of both Google and Alphabet. Um, Alphabet rolls up, you know, there's Waymo and then some other uh, ventures that maybe you haven't heard of yet, like Calico, DeepMind uh, and Loon. Uh, Google Fiber as well. Under the Google side, that's where you probably interact with the most. This has like the hardware divisions like Nest uh, and Android, so you have a Pixel phone or one of the thermostats, and also has uh, what makes the um, uh, the majority of the money is the, the ad side. So when it comes to Google search and Google YouTube, that's where uh, Google makes the majority of the revenue. Um, we see a lot of growth coming from Google Cloud as well. Uh, Google Cloud is basically where you can upload your data and then you know, it's, it's similar to uh, Amazon Web Services or, you know, Microsoft Azure solution as well. Uh, but the majority of revenue that uh, Google maintains is through uh, search and YouTube. And so if, you know, a company would like to uh, place ads on either search or YouTube, um, they kind of need to figure out a way to do it. All the products are self-served or self-service. So you could start a Google ads account and yourself just start getting ads running, just like if you were running on Facebook or Twitter. Um, but if you kind of reach a certain size and if you're becoming more sophisticated, uh, that's when uh, you would probably be connected with um, somebody at Google. Uh, so if you go to the next slide. So I have sales here in quotations because we are a sales team. We do have quota. We you know, are supposed to drive a certain amount of revenue in order to get a bonus. But Google has the advantage of having so many products and it tends to be very good products that I don't feel like it's less about sales and more about like consulting. So oftentimes people are 
Um, when we speak to somebody, they're already using a Google product and it's really about helping them get the most out of it and then maybe showing them the opportunity. Uh, hey, if you do this a little bit better, you'll probably make more money for your business. And then hopefully if you're making more money for your business. You then spend more with Google and then that makes more money for Google as well as the business. So again, we are definitely a sales team, but I don't think it's as salesy or, um, you know, it's kind of a traditional sales as maybe some, some other products that you would run into. Um, in the Google Ann Arbor office, the vast majority of people are on a sales team. Uh, there's a couple different organizations. One works with uh, slightly larger companies um, with more teams that are kind of experts in that vertical or in that industry. So an example, I work on the ticketing and gambling industry team. So my clients are uh, companies like StubHub and FanDuel. And so everyone on my team, the clients that they work with are related to those uh, two companies or, you know, gambling or selling tickets. And so we're kind of not only an expert in Google products, but we're also an expert in that specific industry. So we can give a lot of industry insights as well. Um, the other organization works a little bit more scaled, as we say. So uh, they have some very, very large clients as well that spend um, uh, incredible amounts of money with Google. But sometimes they'll be similar to that where they'll be kind of uh, related to a specific industry or uh, you know type of advertiser uh, but there's also instances where they work with uh, you know a googler might work with a large number of clients so maybe you know have even upwards of you know 100 plus accounts that they have to reach out to um, so you go all the way from having maybe you know three or four clients that you work with or sometimes maybe even two two other googlers have like a hundred quote unquote clients um, and so if they're doing the more scaled approach and have that, um, you know, they kind of figure out, okay, how do I have this entire book, this large book and uh, figure out how to kind of have an, an overall impact there. Um, to give you, before I introduce uh, Osaid and Ahab, I'll give you a little bit more background on myself just very quickly, because you're probably tired of hearing me, me speak already. But um, again, I've been at Google about six years. Uh, previously, uh, way long time ago, um, I was a student at Eastern Michigan University. Um, I was a accounting and marketing uh, dual discipline major. And then I bumped into one of uh, Dr. Gibson's um, Google ads classes. And I thought it would be a nice little extra skill to have, you know, on my resume. Uh, but I really enjoyed it. And, um, that, you know, I think I was halfway decent at, uh, at the class and looking at analytics and figuring out how to work with Google ads. So it took a few more, uh, the other classes that were offered. And in the final class, a couple of my uh, fellow students, we uh, decided to start a uh, LLC together. Uh, so we were doing some freelancing. And so we figured we'd combine our efforts, start an LLC. Uh, we did not make a lot of money. And by a lot of money, I think the entire, you know, a couple of years we worked together, I might've made like $400 total, but it was a great experience. And it was a great way to kind of like see how we could, you know, work and collaborate with others and, you know, try to build a business. Um, through there, through starting that LLC, I developed a relationship with a local uh, marketing company called Pure Visibility, which is still around today. Um, so I worked there, and that's really kind of my my first like salary position and uh, working with Google Ads and you know, Facebook Ads and LinkedIn Ads and learning SEO. Uh, so I was there for a few years, and then I moved to uh, I Prospect Detroit, which uh, some of you are probably familiar with. Um, so I was working on the General Motors account. Uh, eventually, I was managing a team there before uh, coming to Google. I, I think one of the most helpful things we can do is kind of share how we got to Google. Um, I was approached on LinkedIn by a recruiter. I interviewed for a role. I did not get the role. Um, embarrassing story. I wore a suit to the office uh, for the interview, and everyone kind of looked at me interesting in an interesting way because I was extremely overdressed. So uh, luckily, about a year or so later, I think my experience and skill set aligned more with a, another role. Um, and so I was actually able to interview again. Um, and then I was able to get that role six years later. Um, I'm now um, you know, still happily at Google, again, working on the ticketing and gambling clients. So that's a lot for me. I wanted to give you kind of overview of Google, kind of what's in Ann Arbor, a little bit about myself. And then before we kind of jump into some specific career opportunities that maybe might align with people on this call, um, I would love to turn it over to uh, Osaid and kind of um, hear his, uh, you know, hear his background here. You know, we can talk about his journey, um, you know, kind of from Eastern uh, through Google and what he's working on today. 
For sure. Awesome. Thanks for the intro, Eric. And my Google journey is a little bit different. I started off as a bold intern in 2019 um, on the Canada scale division. So that's the division that Eric was talking about that manages roughly about 120 clients. Um, from there, the internship is essentially like an 11 week interview. I was asked to come back to start in June 1st on that same scale team um, that I interned on, worked on that team for roughly about uh, three quarters before transitioning over to the accelerated growth team, which I'm a part of now. Um, been on the accelerated growth team for roughly about two for actually th this will be my third quarter going on into my fourth um, difference be between those teams the teams that I, the team that I first started on is um, I was assigned those 120 clients to begin with and was asked to um, essentially encourage product adoption within those accounts that I was assigned on my new team I signed those clients which which gives me the freedom to choose which clients to work with um, assess revenue opportunity and work with clients over a 90-day period um, and accelerate their business through Google ads, essentially. So that's a little bit about where I'm at um, right now for the most part. And I'd like to pass it over to Ihab. Thank you, Osaid. Thank you, Eric. Thank you everyone for being on the call. Um, so I am just giving my background from EMU. Um, I did graduate from Eastern Michigan in December of 2019. I was a marketing major. Um, with a focus on integrated marketing solutions, which always felt like a, just a fancy way of saying the word advertising. And I had this dream in at Eastern. I was like, all right, I want to work for Google. I heard they serve free food. And, and that became my goal. I used to pass it every day on the way to school too, uh, the Ann Arbor office in downtown at least. And then we moved to Traverwood and I applied straight out of college and I did not get it similar to Eric. I did not get it my first time. I uh, applied again and I did get the role, but it was based out of Chicago. And so uh, I, after speaking with my family at the time, I did not want to leave the city of Ann Arbor. I was coaching basketball at the time. So I ended up turning down the job of my dreams at my dream company um, because I was choosing my personal uh, pr principles and, and, and wanted to stick around and be with my family here in Ann Arbor. So I turned that down. And then a few months later, um, right after I graduated in December 2019, they reached back out and said, hey, we have a position in Ann Arbor that actually might suit you. So I applied to that and ended up getting the role on the Google agency team here in Ann Arbor, serving the Canada region. And I worked on that for about two years. Um, what I think is the most amazing part of my journey at Google, I'm no longer in that role. I'm currently based out of uh, San Francisco, still living in Ann Arbor, but I'm on a team called Kickstart Plus. What we do is uh, we just work with startups based out of Silicon Valley that were recently funded. It's a really cool role. Um, but I think the coolest part about my journey is as an EMU alum, I kind of spent a lot of time hearing my senior year at Eastern at the COB about how um, going directly from EMU's undergrad to Google is probably a long shot. They really only take U of M grads, uh, they're gonna take, you know, higher university or higher established universities. Um, I would have to either get my MBA or just get some several years of job experience before then, uh, which I didn't really subscribe to that mentality. I thought I was very adequately prepared. And so after applying, I did get the role. Um, I'm actually, a, you know, one of those EMU students who went to Eastern as my second option. I was rejected from the University of Michigan three separate times. Um, coming out of my senior year of high school and then twice as an EMU undergrad student to be a transfer. So three times as a reject, I thought, okay, there's no shot I'm going to get into Google, but I ended up getting it right out of college. And on my very first day um, at Easter, at, at Google, I should say, I was being given a tour by one of my teammates at the time. And I was in that like, quote unquote, nap room, not a nap room that Eric was talking about a few minutes ago. And I was just sitting there kind of just reflecting on the last year of my life and getting to Google. And so I was just working on my laptop there and in comes about 15 to 20 students from the University of Michigan's Ross School of Business. Um, they were being given a tour um, from a Ross alumni. And I remember them, they had just walked through the cafe. So they just seen all the food that Googlers were eating. And now they're walking into this like kind of a nap room. They see a massage par parlor. So they were really excited as was I. And I think they were, they were kind of um, had a little bit of FOMO. And one of them raised their hands as my teammate introduced me, hey, this is Ehab, it's his first day. Um, and we're, we've, we're just showing him around as well. And one of the students raised their hand and asked me, 
hey man, this place looks awesome. How do I end up in your shoes? And it was kind of a full circle moment for me because I had spent my basically the entirety of my undergrad asking how I can end up in his shoes. Um, all of that to just say, it was a pretty amazing moment to feel like I had come from a really strong background of marketing and sales knowledge that I acquired at the COB, um, taking some of those marketing classes. Um, I, I was not blessed enough to take the Spark internship and work with Dr. Gibson, but um, the program that he had developed, I was definitely around it, the marketing association, all of those things really prepared me to be in that moment. And, and I think that's just a, all a testament to say that y'all are in a really good path right now. And these are the forms that you want to utilize and gather everything you can to take into your careers in the next few years. So I'll stop my rant there. Please let me know if you have any questions, but uh, I'm really happy and privileged to be a part of this forum and help you all guide on your path as well. I think that's a great story. I always love the, you know, of course you're, you bump into some, you know, Ross students in the, in the nap room. That's a very, very Google story, but I no, I think that's great advice. Like, uh, I would say you mentioned you were, you came into kind of like one of the scaled the compositions and then moved over to the accelerated growth team or AGT. Um, so that's a great example of even just being at Google a short time, you, uh, you, you pivoted to a different role. Um, so what were the, be curious to know, what were some of the skills either from the internship or, you know, school that translated to your first position? And then how did that kind of shift and change when you, what other additional skills did you need or what did you learn when you switched to another role at Google? For sure. So I think the um, the biggest school that you, the biggest skill that EMU provided me was the ability to network. With EMU being such a, a much smaller school, um, it was much easier to get closer to the marketing department or what, whatever your major is. I actually majored in economics, um, so it had nothing to do with advertising or marketing for the most part. The internship was actually my first exposure to marketing. Um, but I think EMU provides just a tremendous platform to network and meet people at a much smaller scale. Um, allowing you to really develop the deep relationships with people and that carries on very well into into the role i mean with the scale goal you're managing so many clients um you kind of have to build a relationship fairly quickly and uh, set yourself to influence the account within just a couple calls if not the first call um and what really fueled my transition onto the accelerator growth team was i felt more comfortable going deeper with a few clients and managing a ton of clients at scale with the accelerated growth team, I have roughly about six to seven clients maximum over a given time. Whereas on the scaled um, team, I have roughly about 120 accounts. I mean, I found myself consistently getting sort of overly invested in my accounts when I really need to do the job at scale. Um, so having the Excel being on the accelerated growth team really allows me to focus on just a few accounts, focus on scaling those accounts, develop those relationships fairly deeply over a 90 day period. Whereas on the scaled org, I've maximum like to meet with the client maybe once or twice per quarter and then kind of move on to to the next um for the most part but that's really what fueled fueled my transition do you think working with such a large number of clients does that help you kind of quickly get up to speed so did, did that kind of so when you, you did have a smaller number of clients when you only had five or six and you were like wow i really have to make an impact with these like you know if i'm only going to you know, speak to them two or three times a quarter did that did you kind of learn that skill and then translate some of that to even when you had a fewer number of clients? Yeah, I think the the biggest value um, from scale that I have now on, Excel, on the accelerated growth team was the um, consistent product knowledge. Once you're tapping into roughly about 120 accounts quarter mm -hmm. over quarter, and a lot of them vary, you deal with so many different issues, so many different business strategies, and you really have to create, you, you get really good at crafting super tailored solutions for our clients fairly quickly. Um, and that's exactly what, what the accelerated growth team is. So I think just the the quick exposure to many accounts really sets you up for success from a product standpoint, as well as from a communication standpoint. Um, even from a confidence standpoint, many of the clients that I sign now on the accelerated growth team have similar business models to accounts that I've worked with on scale. So it's always helpful to come in with, with just a broad business knowledge on what the industry is doing, how, what struggles they may have. For example, a lot of my e-commerce companies are struggling with supply chain right now because of COVID. Um, you know, walking in with just that broad industry knowledge is always super helpful. And I think scale gives you that good grit component as well as just product knowledge and the ability to, to outreach as well. It seems like it's a good, I know we, a lot of people coming from, uh, coming direct from college or if it's their, you know, second or third job, 
go the more scaled route at Google. And I think kind of the the reason is a lot of, or the, it's to give people a lot of the skills that you just mentioned. So it's really kind of, you know, it's scaled. So you have, you get a lot of reps, you know, so to speak. So you, you have a lot of accelerated learnings and then you can kind of then, you know, go deeper with specific clients. But I think that's a good example of just people's careers in general. So even, um, even though I've basically been working on one team at Google, the industry is always changing. I'm getting new clients. And so I think one thing students don't realize is how quickly whatever company they work for will change or whatever the industry that they're in will change or, um, you know, the role that they're in will change. So even if you don't get a new job or a promotion, uh, there'll be a lot of shifts. So don't worry too much about, you know, this, this 12 year path or, that you have or something, uh, things are going to shift so much. And so you need to kind of always be making the correct decisions. Um, you know, you'll, you'll have an opportunity to maybe work with a different client, take a different role, go to a different company and just kind of look at each of those in isolation and kind of keep, um, keep trying to, put yourself along the, the best path because things are going to, going to be rapidly changing, especially if you go into, you know, marketing and digital marketing, which changes all the time. Um, Ehab, I know you, you had kind of your own, you know, you were a bit of an entrepreneur. And so now you're kind of work with working with entrepreneurs and startups. How did, did that experience kind of help you like relate to the people that you're working with in your role now? Relate, I'm not sure. I had my own business uh, where I was working with small startups like on the social media world, on Instagram, mm -hmm. not working with, you know, multi-million dollar funded companies. I wish I could relate to them in that sense, but not, not necessarily. That's but fair. Uh, yes, no, no. To answer your question, I think the at least the mentality of being very much on the ground um, has helped. So for context, I did start while I was at Eastern, my own small little advertising company where I was helping small athletic apparel companies, um, building up their campaign strategies for Facebook, Instagram, and very slightly on Google as well, working via short, mostly via social media. And the idea of companies not necessarily knowing what their profit model is like very, very early on, very early in the stages, that's who I'm currently working with now. So Silicon Valley is basically, um, like San Francisco, Redwood City, just the entirety of the Bay Area, a vast majority of all like new startups are coming out of that, right? VCs or venture capitalists will find these new companies, fund them because they believe in the idea. And then to get their name out, they'll utilize the Google team, Kickstarter Plus, to really help build their strategy from there. So that's kind of what I'm on to, very on the ground. Um, a lot of my companies have no idea how much money they're making, no idea what even their profit margins are but they know that they have a lot of money to spend. And so that's where we come in. I think uh, I want, one thing I just wanted to point out, Eric, and, and, and say just to the, to the panelists or to the, to the attendees here, I love my job, right? I really love working at Google, but I would not say I have a burning passion for sales. I wouldn't have a, say I have a burning passion for Google ads. One thing I do have a burning passion for is waking up in the morning and not being defined by my job. I love to get up and do my work. And today, it's a Friday at 3 p.m., I can close my laptop and not think about my job on Saturday and Sunday. That, that's something I feel most privileged about. Yes, I'm acquiring so many skills, um, whether it be just understanding business models, understanding funding, understanding how to run Google ads and, and campaigns and, and marketing strategies. I'm so, so blessed to know all of that, but the biggest blessing is to be at a company that gives me the balance to, to the work-life balance to enjoy my family, enjoy my life, while also having a really great career. Because at the end of the day, I don't do this because I love Google ads. I do this to make money and provide for my family. That's why we're all here. So I just wanted to make that note that everything that we're talking about relates to, to my why and my purpose. And that's definitely, a this is definitely a company that gives me the privilege to continue to pursue that. That's a, that's a great point. I, specific to the work role too, in that regard, I, I often say one of my favorite things about Google is they let you, they'll give you guidance, but they'll let you be yourself in your role. Um, so if you're an introvert and you communicate great over email and you, you know, have kind of a specific style of working that is effective, that's awesome. If you're an extrovert, you hate writing emails and all you want to do is be on the phone or hopping on a 
Zoom or Google Hangouts or a VC, or you want to travel a lot and be in front of the, the client all the time and maybe put more decks together, they'll let you do that too. So it's really more of kind of like, here's, here's the output, here's the goal that we want you to do, make the role your own. Um, so when you start at Google, it's almost a bit frustrating because there's not a lot of processes or guidance. It's uh, you really do, you hear the cliche of self-starter and, you know, a hard worker, uh, but that really is one of the attributes that is needed because they give you so much freedom. So it's, it can even be frustrating or scary when you start um, or if you're starting a new role, because it's just like, here you go, figure it out. Um, but again, the, the main thing is you have a client, help them get the most out of Google, and hopefully they will then spend money with Google. But that's about all the direction. Um, but I think, like I have mentioned, that then the benefit of that is it translates into, yeah, I'm really good at my job. I you know, get my work done so I can shut down at 3 p.m. on a Friday and I don't have to answer emails on Saturday, which uh, I've had other jobs where you have to answer emails on Saturday. So sometimes it's nice. Um, I would love to, because I think you have an OSITE have such great experience, um, like coming into Google, interviewing multiple times, uh, which is their event thing, and then the bold internship. I would love to jump ahead and talk about some of the career opportunities. Um, so let's talk about the career opportunities, internships. I'd love to them have kind of comment on that. And then we're seeing some good comments and questions come through. So again, feel free to throw comments or questions into the chat for the Q&A. We'll make sure to get to, I think we'll have plenty of time to get to all those. But uh, Jamie, if you wouldn't mind going a couple slides, I wanted to, one more slide board. Yeah, so um, if you take down anything today, I would uh, jot down this URL. Uh, luckily, it's also easy to find if you search for it, uh, but cruise.google.com slash program slash bold. Uh, bold is the program that Osai mentioned. Uh, there's a few different ways you can interact with it. One is if you're a third or fourth year uh, student, um, so you're a year or two from graduating, you can apply to the Bold internship. Paid internship program, um, I believe both sides mentioned it's 11 week program, uh, very, you know, typical program. Applications open in the fall, uh, so this coming fall, so in several months for the summer of 2023. So the applications closed a few months ago for this coming summer. So um, you'd have to look forward to next summer. Also, if you're a bit younger and if you're in your second year of college, there's more of kind of like a uh, more of like a training called the Bold Immersion Program, um, which again isn't a paid internship, but kind of like you know a, a different program where you get exposed to a lot of different things. Um, and then if you're a senior, um, so if you're in your last year of school and you're expecting to graduate, um, we encourage you to go to the basically to start looking at full-time jobs. So careers.google.com/students is one of the best ways. Um, there's opportunities all the time in all of our offices, uh, but if you would like to stay local, um, the I think the, the account strategist role is one that's fairly common, that's uh, very, uh, that uh, recent graduates are typically qualified for. That role could, you know, as they have mentioned, it could place you in Chicago and various other places, but that's one of the, the main roles that we hire here for Ann Arbor as well. Uh, if you go to the next slide. Um, so, I grabbed these from our uh, people ops, HR people, uh, the hiring team. So a few tips for your resume. So say you, you see these and you would like to like to engage and like to apply. Um, the cliche that we always say is uh, demonstrate impact. Uh, basically what that means is if you um, are on a group, you're on a project, you're in a class, you are at a job and you, you, you had impact, you helped move things forward. Uh, great examples are Hey, I was working for this, uh, you know, maybe I was working at a, a restaurant or something and um, I put together like a training manual and then they ended up using that training manual after I left or I put together some process for one small department and it ended up working really well. So all these other departments started using it also. Um, it, ideally, you know, if you have impact and it, you could put a dollar amount or, you know, we, we were this much more productive, that's great. But impact can also just be process and uh, you know other things. So basically, you instead of just being a member or being a contributor to a group, an organization, or a job, um, something that you did was then you know rolled out more broadly, or it helped move the business forward. Um, speaking to your brand, so figuring out you know kind of what are you passionate about, um, and then how does that uh, you know how does that connect with a potential role? So letting them get to know you a little bit. 
transferable skills, pretty obvious. So if you're applying for like a sales role, um, you know, even if you don't have direct sales experience, customer service or working directly with people or maybe working with a Google product um, helps. And again, obviously always show your education, your experience and any leadership that you have. Uh, if you go to the next slide. Um, so getting into a little bit more of the intangibles, um, when you're going through the interview process, uh, they'll look at um, how the candidate thinks, leadership skills, role-related knowledge, and Googliness. So these are kind of the four main pillars that they look for during the, uh, the interview process. If you go to the next slide, I try to dive a little bit deeper into some of those. So on the left here is um, some of the, the attributes that Google specifically looks for. We're looking at candidates. So complex problem solving. So anytime you're, um, you know, you're interviewing or on your resume that you can show that you're not, you're, you're able to look at complex issues or business challenges or challenges in whatever group or organization you're in, um, coming up with a solution. Again, that goes back to, they're not gonna tell you how to do your job. They'll just tell you kind of where they want you to get to and you kind of figure out that way on your own. Uh, analytical ability is really helpful. You don't have to be some you know, programmer or you know, whiz with data sets, but being able to gain, gather information, it could even just be like uh, things that are the client is happening with or something that's going on in the business and then figure out what to do. So it doesn't have to be like full data programming. It could even just be like getting, um, you know, hearing, orally hearing information from a client or somebody you're working with strategic thinking, and intellectual curiosity, understanding the problem, um, gathering and synthesizing data. Again, doesn't, you don't have to be a programmer to do this, but again, getting a lot of information and then figuring out what to do with it um, is very important. Um, and then on the role-related knowledge, role related knowledge. If you do have overlapping skills with a role you're applying for, again, it doesn't have to be directly related. You don't have to be within Google ads or, you know, a YouTube creator or something. But if you were, you know, if you were a bartender, you have customer service, service experience. If you were a trainer at a restaurant or a retail store, uh, that shows how you collaborate with other people. I think one of the most important things besides kind of showing that impact I mentioned earlier is the rate of advancement. So if you were getting promotions, promotions is obviously a very easy way to show rate of advancement, but even little things like you were giving more responsibilities or your role expanded. Um, so I would encourage you don't always just think of things like, okay, I got a promotion or I you know, worked with Google ads or I was a salesperson. Think about how you can kind of more loosely connect your experience with a potential role at Google. Um, so again, rate of advancement doesn't just have to be promotion. Um, I was you know, given more hours, I was giving more projects, uh, I started collaborating with other teams, I was pulled into other meetings. Any, sh any way that you can show the impact or the advancement is really what I think uh, Google looks for. Um, and then obviously if you have similarities in your previous role or work. So um, a lot of learning Google tools, this is the same with you know Facebook or other companies as well. You can get certifications and do different things. So even if you just show that you kind of have a commitment and passion um, on that end, uh, you can then tie it back to um, Google in the process. Um, and if you go to the final slide here. So the interview process, this is always changing. So hopefully this is still somewhat, uh, you know, this might even be pre-COVID. But uh, typically, let's just assume COVID goes away and we have kind of a normal internship uh, or career process, you know, the next year. So you typically have a couple phone interviews um, and then you have three to four on-site interviews. I remember when I had my on-site interviews, I was astounded at like, I, I swear, when the clock struck, you know, the 20 minute mark or whatever, there was a knock on the door and the next person came in. I was always, I was like, oh, wow, this is, these people are methodical uh, keeping on time. So you do the onsite interviews, you meet with people and they'll kind of each uh, handle different attributes. So they'll, they'll kind of easy, answer different questions or ask you different questions to try and kind of gather more information about you on the previous topics that we covered. Um, then the, uh, the committee review, this is kind of an interesting thing. So there's always a, uh, there's a kind of a slow landing to a plane. Um, they'll often look at you and say, Hey, so we, we like you, we would like you to be a final candidate, but then there's all this other stuff. Now we kind of have to justify you. So you don't go from interviewing to a straight job offer. You then have to kind of help them put together almost a package on you. So then they go and then they sell you to the, the committee review and then they review the role. This is a very good thing. It prevents, you know, nepotism and people just hiring their, you know, their buddies and friends, but it is kind of intimidating because you just went through this very stressful interview process and then you kind of have to help them sell yourself. But the good news is once the team interviewing you wants you, uh, they're not going to move you to the committee review unless they feel confident. So everyone's kind of pulling for you, 
but there is one other additional step which makes it a little bit more stressful. And then there's the offer. And then there's the even more stressful background check, which you know is, might even be the most nerve-wracking portion. But then hopefully, if you go through all of this uh, experience, you know, maybe like Ahab, you go through it twice, um, and you you come and work at Google or a, or a similar company that uses this process. So that's a lot from us. I want to leave plenty of time for Q and A. So definitely, um, I'll go through the chat here and the uh, the Q and A as well. So throw anything in here that you would like to cover. Uh, let's see, going back, uh, Zachary West says, I think this might be for Osai, he says, what strategies did you use to transition from working with few clients to over 100 people? Or, oh, so we might have described it wrong. So he was asking strategies working with a few people to over 100 people. But so maybe, maybe Osai, I think you kind of touched on it. But yeah, what, what kind of different strategies did you have working with a lot versus few? Yeah, so when you're working with a lot of people, a lot of it is just about productivity and efficiency for the most part. So, you know, how many emails can I crank out in a day? How many how many client calls can I crank out in a day? Um, you know, how many, what is sort of the least amount of calls that I need to, to get this user to, to adopt a product? Whereas on the accelerated growth team, you're way more invested in the business and in the business's bottom line. Um, you have the time to ask the business questions on their profit margins, on profitability, and can really take that time to to really customize your solutions. Whereas on scale, when you're managing so many clients, um, you do that at a very surface level, and you kind of have to find the quickest recommendation um, that would be good for the business, so you can kind of so you can move on to the next. So having less clients just allows you to be a lot more intentional with um, the solutions you provide, and just a lot more data driven and more. Um, more kind of in the weeds of the account rather than when you're managing with many more. Got it. That's great. Uh, Daro, more of a comment, says we need a swimming pool on the balcony. Um, I agree. We don't have that balcony anymore. Now we're in Trey Ruid, but yeah, swimming pool. I know. I do know in the Mountain View campus, they have like some swimming pools and stuff like that. So that'd be good. They actually, uh, we have a nice little outdoor patio and someone not from Michigan put up, uh, like they painted kind of this wall so that we could project movies. Um, you don't want to watch movies, but if anyone knows in Ann Arbor, um, basically it gets dark in the summer when it's actually warm enough to be outside after work, uh, it doesn't get dark until like nine. So we painted this nice, you know, movie projector thing on the wall, didn't use it once. And I think about a year or two ago, right before COVID, they repainted it with a mural. So we're always tweaking. So maybe we'll do a swimming pool at some time. Um, Chris sounds like she had a cool experience. I did a field trip to the Ann Arbor office a few years ago. Uh, Chris, unfortunately, we are not doing any kind of like non-business um, visitors for this foreseeable future. So um, really no family or friends or anything like that. Um, so we don't have anyone we could connect you with um, for any field trips or anything for a while. But um, maybe once, you know, if and when COVID kind of fully comes down, you could definitely reach out to any of us, you know, via LinkedIn or email. Um, we can try to connect you with somebody. Um, are there any additional, and Osai, and yeah, feel free to jump in here too if you have any thoughts on these, but um, Ashley asks, are there any additional courses or certifications that I would need to acquire to boost my chance of possibly working at Google? Um, you can get certified in Google Ads. Um, it does have help to have a little bit of knowledge, but I do know there's also like certifications in Google Analytics. So I do know plenty of people that get certified without really like directly practicing. Um, but if you just search online for, you know, Google Ads certification, Google An Analytics certification, that really helps. Um, but in addition to that, just doing anything that kind of shows a passion and kind of you working on something outside of school or your role helps. I remember years ago, um, I hired somebody who had like a travel blog and uh, she was just exper experimenting with SEO. It was only getting like a few dozen visitors a day, but that kind of showed like her additional passion and kind of learning, you know, uh, SEO. And so she was a copywriter. Um, we hired her on the agency side for that. Um, I don't know if the two of you have any other kind of additional piece of advice or things that they could add to the resume. I'll say I'll plus one the, uh, the Google Ads certification. Um, and I think there's always uh knowledge that you can have on the industry itself rather than just saying I'm, i know about google ads but knowing about the competition as well right knowing about facebook ads and instagram ads TikTok is huge in the space now mm -hmm. um knowing about the industry will actually help with the role that's pure role related knowledge so 
something I would plug there. Um, I also want to apologize. I do have to jump. I have a client call that I need to get to right now. Um, I really do want to thank Eric for, for help allowing me to join this, um, the other panelists for hosting this, and then the attendees. I really do feel privileged to be a part of this. Thank you. I apologize. I have to leave. Um, but I hope we can do this again very soon. But thanks, everyone. I'll see you. Um, and definitely jot down our names. Feel free to contact us uh, via LinkedIn. Like I said, we always try to connect with as many people as we can. So um, we're some of those people where when we say reach out to us, we definitely mean it. So um, Absolutely. yeah, thanks you have. Thanks, Go. Good luck on the client call. Thank you. Bye. Um, Dr. Gibson mentioned that uh, a lot of resume building um, in the digital summer clinic. I totally second that. So um, I'm obviously a big fan of the digital summer clinic being executive residence, but something like that is yet another uh, great tool that would stick out on your resume. Awesome. So <clears throat> I, I like EHOB. I actually have to hop off in, in a couple yeah, minutes, no but thing I do want to um, really emphasize is actually, I think at Google, there's a ton of value in not having a lot of traditional experience. I mean, I came from mm -hmm. an economics background, very, um, you know, almost little to no marketing experience. I think Google sees a lot of value in that sort of outside thinking and kind of bringing that different perspective. So if you don't feel like you have those certifications, or you don't have a lot of knowledge in marketing or integrated solutions, I would, um, I would not hide that. I know, I know a lot of people who, who may kind of put their, their real experience on the back burner and kind of look for little opportunities that they can highlight on the resume that kind of emphasize marketing. Um, however, I think, you know, walking in with just a strong forefront on what you're good at and, and showing that you're, you're able to learn um, is the most important thing. When Google looks at a resume, um, I'm <clears throat> fairly confident that's one of the biggest things that they look for. One of our GBO hows is sort of navigating ambiguity and your ability to learn and you showcasing that through marketing through finance, through, um, I know actually a lot of people on my team are pre-med originally, whatever it may be, um, is really a big trade that Google's looking for, most definitely. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining. Totally understand if you have to leave, but that's an incredible point to leave on too. Yeah, so lean on, going back to some of the attributes like the critical thinking, navigating ambiguity, things like that, if you can, regardless of your field or experience, uh, hire the talent, train the skill is I think definitely something that happens here at Google. Awesome. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks for having me. All right. Um, Lucid says, I'm thankful for the tour, but does Google offer a supply chain position? I don't believe we do, especially out of college. Um, again, that could be something where, you know, if you are a supply chain student, um, you're definitely doing critical thinking and figuring out how to connecting different things. Um, so if you're interested in kind of pivoting slightly, again, would not discourage you from applying to Google, but we don't um, coming out of college, there isn't kind of a direct like supply chain thing. Um, we do have, you know, some massive, you know, hardware and logistical projects, you know, fiber laying undersea cable. So I know, I guarantee you we have a, especially in like the product side, we have a lot of supply chain people, um, but less so kind of out of college, at least that I'm aware of. I think those are all the questions in the chat. Let me hop over to the Q&A. Uh, Tariq asks, how does Google prepare new employees for working with clients? Uh, great question. So there's a lot of training. Um, so when you get hired at Google, um, like any company you do, you know, they, they aren't just going to totally throw you in and, you know, you have um, no guidance. Uh, there is uh, several weeks of training. Um, and so it really is getting you up on the product knowledge. And then it's very collaborative. So I think one thing that I like Google does is they kind of expect a slow ramp up period. So they know that the best way to kind of learn is on the job. So it's really a lot of product knowledge, some general skills, you know, this is kind of the, the Google way of selling, we call it. So, you know, these are some light skills on maybe how to format an email or um, different things, but a lot of it is giving you kind of that product knowledge, some, some general skills, and then just shadowing people. Um, so I'm onboarding a few new people onto our team. Um, and it's really just kind of, you know, getting them slowly ramped up. So giving them first a few projects that are maybe not as client facing, um, some more like analytical, pulling data, doing some troubleshooting things where they can kind of do on their own and don't interact directly with the client. And then you give them more and more responsibility. This is probably fairly from, uh, very similar to a lot of roles and a lot of, you know, onboarding, um, but it's that product knowledge and then kind of slowly ramping up. But um, I always tell people, you know, when, when they're a Noogler, when they're new to Google, um, I say really leverage that for at least your first year. So maybe 13 months in, you don't, you can't call yourself a Noogler anymore, but really kind of take advantage of that ramp up time and just absorb as much information as you can. Um, an anonymous question. Ooh, I like this. 
Um, how did your experience at iProspect help you as you started out at Google? Were there any skills you had to self-learn as you entered into the new role? Um, I think one of the biggest things was, so at iProspect, I was managing a team working with you know, various contacts at General Motors. And I worked with uh, you know, Facebook representatives and Google representatives and Twitter and you know, uh, um, you know, Microsoft representatives. And so I think one of the biggest things that helped me and one of the reasons I got the job is I kind of knew the, the good and the bad of those relationships. So if I, you know, you, you generally have your client, you'll often, a bigger, bigger client will have, you know, General Motors, you have the client, you have an advertising agency, probably also have a creative agency. And then you have kind of your, your partners, your Googles, Facebooks, you know, TV networks. Um, and I was pretty experienced in navigating, you know, working with all those different teams. And so one of the things that I was able to bring to Google was, hey, this is how agencies think. And so Google has to work oftentimes with both the client and the agency. And so I was able to um, give them insight into, okay, this is when the agency is asking for this and it doesn't really make sense, this is kind of what they're thinking about. Um, or the agency wants this and this will make them look good. Let's kind of put this together for them, but let's put this together for the client. Um, just like if you, you know, if, if you're trying to figure out if you're starting at a restaurant or starting at a bar or something like that, and you think, what is a pleasurable dining experience that I've had? What is a good time that, you know, I had out at the bar? Um, same thing. You can kind of put yourself in the shoes of the customer, um, and then give them that. It was also just, um, you know, I think my, my role at iProspect, there was a bit of ambiguity. It was kind of like, Hey, just, you know, besides just getting everything done. We were kind of, it was up to us to kind of figure out how to grow the business, how to make the clients more sophisticated um, with whatever they were doing across all the different partners that they worked with. So that's a skill I constantly have to do here at Google is, you know, kind of the two parts of your brain are the client emails you a question that you have to kind of react to. And then the next thing is, okay, what do I need to proactively bring? And so making sure that I'm kind of always bringing something new to them and kind of making sure that they, they continue. Um, oh, shoot, we have a question for outside. Said, AGT role deals with a lot of profit and revenue pipelines. What advice would you give for just starting out in sales consulting on having challenge investment budget conversations with clients? That's a great, that's a great question on the, the budget, the investment. Um, I think number one, you lean on other Googlers who kind of have experience with that. Um, now, maybe say you came from a finance background and you, um, this again is one of those examples where bring the knowledge that you do have and then kind of learn the additional knowledge that you need. Um, so if you came up from a finance background and you are very analytical and maybe it's very easy for you to talk about profit margins and then you know, ROAS targets and ROI and how can we kind of calculate this lifetime value, you can lean on that. If not, um, you know, maybe figure out, maybe you're more of a people person and you're just really good at speaking with a client, figure out how, you know, what questions to ask. And then you maybe sync with another Googler or you know, maybe you read some internal documentation on you know, ROAS, budgeting, kind of figure out those, those things. But overall, when it comes, a, the good thing about our role is we often have data to kind of use. So very rarely are we working with someone where they are totally new to Google, they haven't used anything. So we often have like some data saying, okay, here's where you're currently at. Here's the, the return. Here's the ROI, the ROAS that you're currently making. Um, and then we can calculate kind of the full opportunity. So if you're spending a dollar and making two dollars and um, this is your current budget we feel pretty confident you could increase that budget by 10x still maintain the same profit the same margins uh, before kind of reaching a diminishing returns so it's it's um but sometimes it's not that simple because they need a bit more and so you need to uh, kind of really justify that or kind of think think of an incremental approach so those are those are always conversations that we're having, um, and it's challenging. But it's kind of first about you know building trust, being an expert, kind of in the numbers, being able to show them data that they can rely on, and then kind of walking them through and putting a plan together. Um, let's see, another person had said, "Did they? Is it recommended to submit directly to the recruiting or hiring manager, um, or apply via the website?" If you do know someone at Google, um, so like us, um, it's good to get a referral. Um, otherwise, yeah, um, submitting through the website um, is is typically the, the best way to uh, to submit resumes. I'm gonna hop back over here to for the chat. Uh, 
Um, Ashley asked, she, finishing up undergrad, waiting to uh, fully obtain a degree before applying. Um, if you have an expected graduation date, I believe that'd be, yeah, it'd be no problem applying. Now, you know, if your expected graduation date is eight months from now, um, probably not. But no, I would say, um, if anything, you know, feel free and go ahead and apply. Um, worst thing that would happen is they would see your resume and say, hey, you know, we, re you know, we really like your trajectory. Uh, reach out to us, you know, again, at a, a slightly different time or, OK, you know, this sounds great. We'll put you in the system. We'll kind of keep an eye on you and then we'll come back to you once uh, once you were graduated. I think that's all the questions that I've seen. Um, I don't know if there's anybody else that wants to jump in or or add any questions. All right. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, yeah, and no problem. This was fantastic. I think having all of that background was great. I think it gave people a lot to think about and really good reasons to apply for the summer clinic to get that extra experience. Definitely. Everything we everything we cover, and again, I'm biased. I'm, I have a lot of experience at Google. So as an executive residence at the summer clinic, I'm going to take a lot of my learnings and kind of present that there. So the summer clinic is could not be a more perfect example of kind of like something on your resume and kind of, um, you know, something on your resume that could, you know, help you really stand out for applying in a company like Google. Things like, you know, impact, showing measurement, what questions to ask, all those things are things that I'm constantly talking to the students about on a weekly basis and kind of figuring out how to leverage those skills and kind of tactics of working with the, uh, with the, the startups that they're working with. So yes, cannot say it enough. Is number one slide should have just been, you know, apply for the digital summer clinic. Um, but then hopefully this is some good information on the company as well. And Anna just threw that link back in the chat again, for those of you who need that additional reminder. Um, thank you again, Eric. Uh, for the rest of you, please remember we have another session next Friday um, at 10 o'clock, uh, our virtual Pinterest tour with our other executive in residence, Jarell McCree. Thank you all so much for attending.